All right, those are the nine teams that currently have offensive coordinator openings, which, of course, makes it harder to find a good offensive coordinator because anyone with options may not opt to be your coordinator. So we're going to go through each one, and we're going to apply a number between 1 to 10. How desirable is each opening, with 10 obviously being the most desirable and 1 being the least? Let's start with... The first one that we have on the list, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Todd Bowles entering year two as the head coach after the baton was handed to him by Bruce Arians. Byron Leftwich has been fired after four seasons. How desirable, Chris, to you is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers coordinator job, especially with Tom Brady most likely not coming back? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm assessing this as him not being back. And, I mean, this is low here. Uh, this is not a desirable job. You know, I think we saw some of the issues with their football team this year. I'm, I'm going to put it at like a four, I think, when I look at it. You know, one, yeah, quarterback issue, right. Uh, tight end, okay. You know, they got a young guy or two, Kate Otten's there. Maybe we'll see. Nothing special, though, at least at this point. Running back, solid, nothing, nothing special. Mike Evans, you know, we saw he's, he's losing a step. He's getting to that point of his career. Chris Godwin, good. But, again, he was franchise tagged, right? So we don't know where that's going to go, right? Other third receiver, not sure about. Man, left tackle, Donovan Smith, not very good this year. I mean, really, you could sit there and argue in a lot of ways and go Tristan Wirfs is the best player on their offense right now at right tackle. So, yeah, they're, they're, they got a lot of issues, and they got some rebuilding to do down there in Tampa. What do you think, Mike? Where you put it at? I, I would say it is a three right now, frankly, because I feel like the walls are closing in on the Buccaneers and they're going to have some lean years. So if I go there as the guy in charge of the offense, as the guy who's the play caller, and in this segment we're going to focus on the jobs where the coordinator isn't just sidecar to an offensive head coach. The coordinator's taking over the offense. I don't want to be part of it because I, I feel like yeah. it's done. Todd Bowles I feel like be in trouble over. after the year, that, right? Right. The standard the standard recently is too high. The decline has started, and now they're going to fall off a cliff in 2023. So if I have any other option whatsoever, I'm not taking that job because I'm, I'm signing up. For some of these jobs, you sign up knowing who your quarterback is going to be. For a lot of them, I don't know. Who's the quarterback going to be? Oh, I can't wait to bring my offense to Tampa Bay. Let me know who the quarterback's going to be. Right. Well, we'll let you know in a few weeks. Go ahead and start working on your offense. We'll let you know who's actually going to be, you know, running the plays <laughs> at the appropriate time. It's not going to be Brady. Blaine Gabbard, I remember not that long ago, Bruce Arians was saying Blaine Gabbard's the most underrated player in the NFL. Okay, Bruce. Kyle Trask has been, who knows? We haven't seen him play. They used a second-round pick on Kyle Trask in 20. 21 yeah. years really do That's start right. to kind of blur together. So, hey, they, they may have options in free agency, but if you're a free agent, do you really want to follow Tom Brady for a team that feels like its best years are behind it and they're in the midst of a full rebuild. It's almost like they have to bottom out and draft a franchise quarterback. So, to me, that's a three at best, maybe a two Yeah, in Tampa right. Bay. Okay, all right, good. You got four, I got that. I, mean, I probably should have probably made it a three myself. Just, you know, again, I think when you add on the – Wait, if it doesn't go well, Todd Bowles can be in trouble type of thing this year. They, you got to think about the the appeal of that as well. Um, so I'm with you. All right, well, who's the next team you want to hit on here? All right, next team is the Baltimore Ravens. And <laughs> to greater sense of stability, a playoff team, more attractive from that perspective, Chris. I'll go first on this one. I don't know who the quarterback's going to be in Baltimore. Now, as part of the interview process, you're going to ask some tough questions. What's your plan for Lamar Jackson? Do you think you can sign Lamar Jackson? If it's not Lamar Jackson, is it Tyler Huntley? Or are we exploring other options there, which would necessarily change the offense? Last Thursday, John Harbaugh, the coach of the team, said their identity will remain the same, which tells me it's either going to be Lamar Jackson or Tyler Huntley, a quarterback. Regardless, you look at the uncertainty with quarterback. You've got 15 years of John Harbaugh. You got to wonder how much longer that's going to last. And you look at how the door has revolved. This will be offensive coordinator number seven for John Harbaugh. Yeah. I'm putting this at a five right now. And I know Harbaugh said that it's going to be a highly desirable job. I don't know that many of them are all that desirable this year, frankly. And maybe five is the highest number I'm going to come up with for any of these. But I just feel like this is a five because, you know, if I knew Lamar Jackson was going to be the quarterback, maybe it'd be a seven. But I don't know he's going to be the quarterback. 
So I'm taking this job just like in Tampa. I got no idea who the quarterback's going to be, and it may or may not be Lamar Jackson. And if it is, it may just be for one more year, and then we got to figure out what we're doing next year. I, it's just, to me, five. Be- best I can do is five. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to go north of that. I mean, I, I want to do as the exercise. I, I, you know, again, I know you're right. I don't know what's going to happen with Lamar Jackson. I'm not grading on a curve. So I'm not. I may not give anybody more than a five. I'm not grading on a curve. Nobody's getting a ten. So the Nobody, franchise. No, yeah, none of these are a ten. So the the the. You know, the, again, I, I do think Baltimore is going to try to make it happen with Lamar Jackson, right? I do, and, you know, there's a part of me, too, that sometimes sits here and goes, man, I, I don't know. There's guys like Anthony Richardson, right, the Florida quarterback who's built like Cam Newton. There's a part of me that sometimes thinks, God, man, maybe draft him and pick whatever you got and, and just start it all over with what you've done with Lamar Jackson. But, like, as far as the sake of this exercise, as we sit here right now, I'm going to say he is going to be the quarterback of the Baltimore Ravens. I think I'm going to give it a six, I think. I want to almost maybe give it a seven if I really knew he was going to be there. It is a really good O-line. We know that. They got running backs. They got very good tight end play. They need receivers. you know. And they do have you know, the, the young guy, I'm blanking on his name, from uh, who they drafted in the first round two years ago from Minnesota. Who Rashad looked, Bateman. Yeah, Rashad, Rashad Bateman, Bateman. Thank you. Yeah, who looked good early in the year before he, he got hurt. So – you know, I'll say six right now. I want to say seven, but that uncertainty of Lamar Jackson does uh, does concern me for sure. Well, and I said if I knew Lamar Jackson was going to be back, I'd say yeah. seven. So the uncertainty affects me a little bit more than it affects you. And I'm not – I don't know. I just really don't know if he's going to be back. I think the most likely way he's back is if they use a non-exclusive franchise tag, he goes out to the open market, nobody just drops a five-year fully guaranteed contract into his lap, right. and he realizes – I can't get from any of these other teams the thing I want from the Ravens. And, oh, wow, the best offer I've gotten is from the Ravens because the Ravens don't have to give up first-round pick plus as part of the transaction. They're in a position to pay me even more, assuming they'll pay him what what they were going to pay him last year, supposedly they, were going to pay him. And, 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 and you know, it's, it bubbled up again over the weekend that the Ravens only offered $133 million fully guaranteed. We talked about this yesterday. Until you know the full deal, you don't know whether or not he should have taken it. The question now is, would that deal be back on the table this year? Chargers. This is one where you know who the quarterback's going to be. This is the one that should be a 10. Should be a 10. But, but, what's going to happen in 2023? especially if Sean Payton doesn't take a job this cycle when he's looming over Brandon Staley for all of 23, Jim Harbaugh, who still wants to come back to the NFL. This is the job everybody wants because of Justin Herbert. Do I want to be that offensive coordinator knowing that this is a stew of potential dysfunction, that that folks may be on the hot seat, and the pressure's on me to get more out of Justin Herbert? We've seen jobs like this. We saw it just last year. When Matt Rule couldn't find an offensive coordinator, so he dusted off Ben McAdoo in his giant sport jacket, uh, and it didn't work. Matt Rule got fired in early October. A lot of pressure on the next offensive coordinator. So that makes it – this is the one I'm going to do the highest. I'm still going to call it a 7 because of Justin Herbert. It should be a 10. But the concern about the job security of Brandon Staley and the rest of the staff – you know, and I understand the, the, the nature of the job is you pack up all your stuff and you move to a new city maybe every single year. I don't want to walk through the door assuming that I shouldn't waste my time unpacking my boxes. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get – I'm going to give it a nine. I am. Just in – well, one mere – you know, this would be one where, Mike, I just look at it and go, I don't know. I don't know. If I was a really hot offensive coordinator, I'd go – and I know the Sean Payton thing, that might be the one thing that really would scare you maybe, you know, a year down the road or whatever. But at the same time, I would feel like, man, if I go there with this guy at quarterback, even if the staff gets fired, it ain't going to be because of me and the offense and whatever. I'm going to get a job somewhere or they're going to keep me because they're going to go, wow, that was damn good. So I, I feel like all you can do is improve your status here as far as at least the way it's set up. I know you got to go out there and do it and put game plans together. But, man, Herbert's special. So Herbert, franchise left tackle, when healthy, I think they got the O-line right. You got Keenan, Keenan Allen and Mike Williams, you know, locked up for another few years. 
You know, Austin Eckler are a good option. There's a lot of good things. They probably need a real between the tackles, first and second down running back. They got decent tight end play. Uh, I, so I, I look at this one clearly to be kind of the crown jewel of all the ones we're talking about because, like you said, I mean, Justin Herbert is clearly one of the four best quarterbacks in football, special, and just starting uh, you know, at the tip of the iceberg as far as career and, and what he can end up being here. And, uh, look, for the same reasons that head coaches would want that job, you would think offensive coordinators would want it because it's a pathway to becoming a head coach, and it gives you a hell of an opportunity to get more out of a guy that it feels like they're not doing enough with Justin Herbert. The next right. offensive coordinator could do a lot more than Joe Lombardi was able to do. All right, Tennessee Titans. Team that was the number one seed a year ago failed to make the playoffs this year after getting bounced week 18 by the Jacksonville Jaguars, quarterback issue, Ryan Tannehill. Then there's Malik Willis, and he yielded to Josh Dobbs, who was barely with the team, barely unpacked his bag before he was starting down the stretch. How desirable is that job? You got Derrick Henry. I don't know how many years he's got left. Tread on the tire. Running backs don't play as long as quarterbacks and receivers. Where would you put that number between 1 and 10 on the Titans offensive coordinator gig? Gosh, I, I'm going to say 6. You know, maybe I'm being kind there. I, I'm I'm giving that Derrick Henry still got another, you know, year, two, three, really, of good play left in the tank, which I, I think is fair to say. He still looks like he's damn good and going to be one of the top running backs in football. The O-line we know is good. Tannehill, yeah, he might not be like, hey, our guy for the next five years, but if I was an offensive coordinator, I'd go, hey, my offense is good. I could I could work with Ryan Tannehill. He can make all the throws. He moves well. He's a good decision maker. So that certainly would be a positive, in my opinion. The big negative, Mike, is what we hit on all year. It's just the, the emergence or who can be some weapons at receiver. Traylon Burks did kind of come on, but then he got hurt and banged up. So we never really got to see the true product there. Um, I, but, I, you know, again, Mike Vrabel, defensive coach, uh, you know, you're going to be able to give him like the keys a little bit like, Hey, here, go coach the team, do your own thing there to a degree. Uh, I'm going to go six. I'm going to go six with Tennessee. I'll go six as well. I'm concerned about where the roster is currently headed, but, but now I'm going to go seven. Here's why I'm going to go seven. Okay. A couple of offensive coordinators of the Titans in recent years have become head coaches. Yeah. Matt LaFleur, Arthur Smith. Not a bad position to be in if you can get the most out of that offense. Also, there's something to be said from just kind of being around Mike Vrabel, learning how he does things, learning how he coaches, as it relates to preparation to take over a team of your own. I think a lot can be gleaned from him as you try to work your way into being guy who can be a coach. Yeah. I think that's... That's yeah. I wonder how many of these offensive coordinators are so caught up in X's and O's versus spending a lot of their time watching and listening and monitoring and learning from the head coach. So it gives me a chance to watch Mike Vrabel, one of the best coaches in the NFL. He's got a great way about how he does things. He's a great leader of men. I'd be prepared better to be a head coach by monitoring him and – and again, I don't know what they're going to do at quarterback. Malik Willis may be a guy that doesn't last there very long, may have been a guy that John Robinson wanted and Mike Vrabel didn't. Mike Vrabel sure didn't act at the end of the season like he thought well, Malik he ain't ready, yet. ready to go. He got we benched for that. Josh Dobbs. Right. And we don't and we don't know what Ryan Tannehill is going to do. And, you know, hey, if I take that Tampa job, there's a chance I'm going to be coaching Tom Brady. Again, that uncertainty, uh, I mean, Tennessee job. There's 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 that uncertainty as to who the quarterback's going to be. But I'd have, I just have a great deal of faith and trust. And I feel like Mike Vrabel, even with a GM from outside the organization, I still feel like Vrabel emerged from what happened with John Robinson with more power. He survived last year's debacle. Yeah, will the seat be a little bit uncomfortable this year? That's okay. It's always uncomfortable. It's, you can go from safe to out in any one year in the NFL. We know how that goes. So I'll, I'll just give it a seven for all things considered and because a pipeline of coaches has already begun to emerge from being the offensive coordinator of the Tennessee Titans with Mike Vrabel as the head coach. Yeah, uh, yeah I, that's, I, that's why I kind of said what I said at the end there too. Mike Vrabel, your head coach, he's going to give you the keys to the offense. You'll learn how to manage games, do stuff like that. But, yeah, I, and again, the Ryan Tannehill thing is not as a concern for me. I mean, he's still – He's still a, a good player, and, you know, whether it's 
long term, whatever. I don't know if that happens, but I think the next year or two, you, you as an offensive coordinator, you look at it and go, well, there's certainly a lot worse options out there than Ryan Tannehill. Jets are looking for an Ooh. offensive coordinator Whoa. and a quarterback, and it feels like the heat has been turned up on everyone in the organization. How desirable, scale of 1 to 10, after Matt LaFleur took the fall for this year, do you like that job for next year if you're a candidate who has options? Give me your number one to ten. I like they got everything except the quarterback, right? And I, I you know, their O line got beat up at the end of the year. But man, their O line at its health, you know, healthiest and what we saw early in the year, they were a force. They ran the ball. They protected pretty good. You know, Brees Hall with what he was doing before he got hurt, right? Michael Carter, the other running back, he's damn good. Receivers got options there. And so I look at everything here with the Jets and go, damn, there's a lot to like here. Now, you know, the quarterback situation is definitely dicey. I don't like the way, of course, Zach Wilson looked. You know, we talked about it. You know, I think he's got extreme talent, but he lost his way this year. And I think the Jets helped him lose his way. I do not agree with how the Jets handled that situation. And really, when they made that decision and made that a situation, the team fell apart. And they fell apart at the end of the season. They made it about one guy. Instead of it's a team sport, they made all their problems after going five and two as a quarterback after one guy, but that is an issue there. But I will say too, it's a year where there's options at quarterback and free agency. Now, not, they're not maybe not going to be superstars. We're not talking about Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrow or Josh Allen, but I think there are some good options there. I, I, I look at this. I'm going to say a seven. You know, I really think the talent is actually, you know, greater than that. The quarterback situation is dicey. Uh, it is. But, I mean, listen, if I was a really good OC, I'd be sitting there going, yeah, okay, wait, we got some options out there in free agency. And, man, I kind of – Zach Wilson can do some special things. Let me see if I can correct him a little bit. So there's a few options at least at the quarterback position to where you don't feel like you're totally handcuffed. Would – and there's been some chatter, and we're going to talk later about Aaron Rodgers. There's been some chatter about the Jets as a, pen a potential destination, right. which is just perfect. It's the Brett Favre career arc <laughs> taken to the next step. <laughs> That's funny. Um, does that make it more attractive or less attractive if it's Aaron Rodgers at this stage of his career? Given everything we know about Aaron Rodgers, is that the guy you want to be working with if you're an offensive coordinator it's, of the Jets? It, it, it's dicey. It's, it's a roll of the dice. You know, I think at one end you're looking at it and go, okay, wait, I got Aaron Rodgers. That'll be good. He's been, he's played, he's experienced, all that. The other thing you have to go, damn, it's Aaron Rodgers, and there's going to be some drama, and he's going to want to do some things the way he wants to do it, and you know, I'm going to have to deal with that and kind of deal with the personality. So it kind of goes both ways there. Um, and and you know, I saw Rodgers talk about, you know, he'd be open to adjusting his his the money he's making and all of that. I saw that quote there. You know, again, I don't know. I guess ultimately, you know, it it'd probably make it more attractive, but you know, you're also going to be a little scared as well. Adjusting the money does not mean taking a penny less than that to which he is entitled. All that means is moving stuff around and doing cap things to make it easier to put him on the roster this year and you kick the can down the road. When I see adjusting, that doesn't mean taking a penny less. So I I think for me, that would make the job less attractive, frankly. I'd want a quarterback that I know is going to be there for more than a year. That's one of the things. I saw Peter King suggested that the Packers want two first-round picks for Aaron Rodgers. Who the hell is giving you two first-round yeah, picks? Crazy. You don't know he's going to play more than one year. Yeah. You know? Um, so and they, they, they can want that, maybe 100% accurate. And Peter said he's guessing. And a lot of times when Peter guesses, he knows. But <laughs> if the Packers want two first-round picks – for Aaron Rodgers, they aren't going to trade Aaron Rodgers because they're not getting two first-round picks for him. Maybe a one plus a conditional second one based upon what he does, how many games he plays, how long he plays. Maybe like a 2025 first-round pick potentially based upon what happens in 23 and 24. But uh, I, it doesn't make it more attractive. To get back to my point, no. And I'd, put, I'd probably put a five on the Jets too, maybe a four, just because it's New York. The you know, you, You've talked from time to time about how – how Jets fans are just like ridiculously and recklessly demanding. And then you, you finally find a quarterback that you're going to try to build around and he gets injured and the other guy comes in and has a good game and, and they throw the one guy overboard and they rally around the other guy. It's just, it's just, there's too much, too much. There's a lot. 
Uh, but and I say and I say if I'm if I'm a coordinator with options, I wouldn't want that job. Well, you know what? I don't know that I want any of these jobs. I maybe Chargers and Titans, but other than that, I I would I don't know what I would do. Uh, all right, one more to do. Commanders. Ron Rivera moves on from Scott Turner. Kind of feels like he was made the scapegoat for a team that almost made it to the playoffs. We don't know who the quarterback's going to be, although Sam Howell is indeed going to be QB1 entering the offseason program, subject to change. How attractive is that, Joe? Well, there's just some things you love. I mean, we hit on it a bunch during the year, right? Running backs, good. Three receivers, damn, you know, good. Really, four. The you know, O-line turned the corner. I think that's an imp- they need to improve there a little bit, but at least they were – you know, capable of running the ball, protecting towards the end of the year, right? The quarterback situation's the the big conversation there for sure too. You know, so I, you know, it's another one where I'm intrigued. There's potential with the talent on the football team. You know, O line improved, quarterback situation definitely a big question mark. But this seems like there's you know, some some options going to be out there. Yeah, I don't again, I don't know if they're going to be long term forever, but. I think good enough options to where, hey, wait, we're Washington. We get Jimmy Garoppolo. We sure up our O line. Hey, we could be, you know, we could be good. We get Derek Carr. Whoa, we could be real good. You know, there, there's going to be that out there. I'm going to say a seven here with them as well. I'm going to say a seven. I think an offensive coordinator is going to like a lot of things about this football team and the offense. You know, the quarterback thing is, is, of course, the number one thing that has to be addressed. I'm going to go with five because. This has a one-year feel to it. Mm. By next year, there likely will be a new owner, and the new owner may want to just press the button and reset everything. And uh, again, part part of, and this is speaking from the perspective of someone who has lived in the same town for nearly thirty years, doesn't like you. Know, just the thought of moving. Well, my wife and I were talking about this the other night. Gee, if we, would we would we ever? I I don't want to move. I don't want to downsize. I don't want to upsize. I don't want to any size. I don't want to have to pack up all my stuff. So I I am not wired to go into a job thinking, well, you know, next year from now I'm probably going to <laughs> we, move. We we know. Probably have to go <laughs> Thank look you for another job. Thank you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so 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 anyway, that that makes it less attractive to me because I think after this season, there's a chance there are going to be major changes unless the Commanders end up being so great in 2023 that a new owner will have no choice but to continue with the uh the coaching staff that's in place hi it's mike florio thanks for watching pft on youtube hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from pro football talk